Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. We are always pouring sound into our heads, whether we're using some kind of speakers or wearing headphones or earbuds or something like that. I'm going to make a guess here. But I'm going to assume that most people demand a certain level of audio quality when they're listening to music. You don't want distortion, and you're hoping for a certain level of sonic realism. You want to be able to close your eyes and feel the music around you. You want to be immersed in it. These sensations, as important as they are to our enjoyment of music, are now taken for granted. But the technological journey that has led us to enjoying music in the way we enjoy it today took decades, and along the way, there were many twists and turns and false starts and dead ends and promising leads and utter failures. This is the story of Stereo, Part 2. This is the Ongoing History of New Music Podcast with Alan Cross. That's a couple of guys from Detroit called I Am Dynamite with a track called Stereo. And that's what we're back to talking about with this edition of the Ongoing History of New Music. Hello again, I'm Ellen Cross, part two of the story of Stereo. On the first half, we went through the deep history of two-channel listening, recording, and playback. And we left off in the 1960s when stereo records became a big deal. They were the thing that was killing off the old mono way of recording music for good. Here's a promotional clip from the late 1950s trying to sell stereo to the general public. This is Bob Banks, marketing manager, radio and Victrola division of RCA Victor. What you're going to hear about today is nothing short of a miracle. It's dramatically new. It's an RCA Victor exclusive, made possible only through years of research, inventions, and innovations. Living stereo played on a record through the all-new, two-in-one, RCA Victor Stereo Orthophonic High Fidelity Victrolas. In this speaker, you can hear the left-hand section of the orchestra predominating. In this one, the right-hand section predominates. And together, they give us the fullness of living Stereo. Two separate and distinct soundtracks. One from one side of the orchestra for one speaker system. Another track from the other side of the orchestra for the second speaker system. Yet both are coming from one record, one groove, picked up by one stylus. Almost like playing two different tunes on the same violin at the same time. To understand how this can be done, let's first recall how regular one-track recording is accomplished. Sound waves reaching the microphone are changed into impulses of electric current. Increased in strength by the amplifier, they flow to the cutting head, moving it back and forth and cutting from side to side in the groove of the record. To play it back, we substitute a stylus for the cutting head. The tip of the stylus swerves back and forth, side to side, in the groove, bending the ceramic bar to which the stylus is attached. When a ceramic bar is bent, tiny impulses of electric current are produced. These impulses of current, again strengthened by an amplifier, are carried to the speaker where they are converted back into sound, the same sound we had at first. Now let's compare a regular record groove having only one soundtrack with the revolutionary new living stereo groove having two separate soundtracks. The soundtrack made by one section of the orchestra is on this side of the groove, while the soundtrack from the other section of the orchestra is on the other side. To play it, we use a special stereo pickup developed, designed, 
and most important, manufactured by the radio and Victrola division of RCA. In this pickup, the stylus is fastened to two ceramic bars instead of one. As the tip of the stylus moves to the right, it bends the bar on the left, producing impulses of current. As it moves to the left, it bends the bar on the right, again producing current. Now let's take another look at our living stereo record groove with its two separate soundtrack impressions, one on each side. In cross-section, it looks like this. A V-shaped groove, 45 degrees on each side. Let's put our living stereo stylus in this groove. As the record turns, the right side of the groove reproduces the sound from the left-hand section of the orchestra. The left side of the groove reproduces the sound from the right-hand section. Now, both at once. Two totally different soundtracks. But stereo just wasn't for records. It was for radio, too. In fact, you're listening to me in stereo right now. I'm assuming on an FM radio. And that took a long time to happen. Let's review from part one. Two-channel radio goes all the way back to the 1800s with something called the teatrophone, which was basically like cable TV with just audio. But when wireless radio got big in the 1920s, all teatrophone companies went out of business. Then there was the idea of using two AM transmitters, two AM signals, and two AM receivers, one for the left channel and one for the right. Okay, not practical. Then there was AM-FM stereo. FM radio was invented in the 1930s by Edwin Howard Armstrong, but really didn't gain any traction until sometime in the late 1950s. At some point during that period, there were experiments with using one AM transmitter and one FM transmitter. A channel was assigned to each. Well, no. No good for obvious reasons. One channel sounded really, really good, while the other was all tinny and flat. This led to FM-FM stereo. It was the same as everything else we just talked about, but with each channel coming through on a different FM frequency. Sounded better for sure, but it required two spots on the dial instead of just one. There was even TV AM and TV FM. The audio of old school VHF TV channels was actually carried on the same part of the spectrum as FM, but outside what you could tune in on a radio, except for the old channel 6. It could be heard at 87.9 megahertz, which is at the most extreme left side of the dial. This TV FM thing was a dumb idea. There were just so many technical problems with it that it's almost not worth mentioning. Well, what about AM FM TV? Yeah, that was tried too in the late 1950s, but was far too complicated and buggy to be ever commercially viable. The solution finally arrived in the form of a technique called multiplexing. This involved combining left and right channels from a source, using one transmitter to beam out the signal, and then having a receiver separate the signal back into left and right channels. But even if you didn't have a stereo receiver, you could still receive and listen to the broadcast, except that it would be in mono. At first, there were at least 17 different types of multiplexing, all being pushed by different companies. After a lot of testing in the late 1950s and early 1960s, it was decided that the multiplex system proposed by General Electric and Zenith were the best. In fact, they were so close in the way they worked that the technologies were pretty much identical. And if you're listening to me on an FM radio right now, you're using descendants of this technology. As far as we can tell, the first two stations to broadcast in this modern form of FM was WEFM in Chicago and WFGM in Schenectady, New York. In the U.S., FM listenership eclipsed that of AM by 1978, and then Canada followed a few years later. FM is generally very good and very stable. It's not affected by things like lightning or power lines. But there are circumstances that can cause the stereo signal to break down, and this is why some receivers still come with a mono button. That switches a weak stereo FM signal down to mono, so you can listen without distortion. Okay, this is fun. It's a promotional film from Philco pushing their portable FM radios in 1965. The big sell in the coming year? AM FM. Here's a natural sell-up from an 8-transistor AM-only set. The hottest value in AM FM history. Model 903. Philco's 9-transistor personal AM FM at only $29.95. 
And this is only the beginning, Mr. D. Philco's most complete line of outstanding values in AM FM portables makes it easy for you to sell your customers up to a full service radio. The first high fidelity stereo FM tuner sold in North America came out in 1961. It was the Scott Model 350. Expensive, but it was the best sound anyone could get from a radio. And now I have an excuse to play a song about FM radio. This is a band called Sweet Fix. Before we leave the idea of stereo radio, we should mention the efforts to popularize AM radio. Starting in the late 1970s, as FM was eating away at the number of people listening to AM, a number of companies thought that they could increase the appeal of AM radio by turning the traditionally mono AM signal into a stereo one. The development process was a mess, devolving into a series of lawsuits and political squabbles. Two competing systems emerged. There was the ISB system, and another one called CQAM, developed by Motorola. By the way, Motorola was the company who invented the first car radio back in the 1930s. AM stereo radio started appearing in GM, Ford, and Chrysler cars in 1984. They all used the Motorola technology. Australian stations started with AM stereo in 1985. Canada and Mexico got on board in 1988, and Japan signed on in 1992. This gave Motorola's CQAM system total market dominance worldwide. And you know what? It did sound better. Not as good as FM, but certainly better than the traditional mono sound that we got from AM. But, uh, you know, big deal. The problem was that for a station to move to AM stereo, it had to buy all new equipment, from the control room to the transmitter. And then to receive the broadcasts, listeners had to have a compatible AM stereo receiver. Now, there were still stations which broadcast an AM stereo, but did you know that? Or did you care? Probably not. Next up, if two channels are better than one, doesn't that mean four channels are better than two? Well, maybe. Hang on. This is part two of a program called The Story of Stereo, the technology that gives our recorded music realism, depth, and multidimensional attributes. We have two ears. That means two speakers, one delivering the left channel of a stereo recording and the other, the right, is more than adequate for most listening. But stereo does have its drawbacks. In the real world, sound comes at us from every direction, not just from the left and the right. Sound bounces off walls and floors and ceilings and other objects. This reflected sound comes at us in slightly delayed discrete bits. To reproduce this realism, you need more than two speakers. And this is where we encounter something called quadraphonic sound. In the 1970s, everyone was getting into hi-fi gear. There was an insatiable appetite for bigger amps and speakers and better turntables and tape machines. The goal was accuracy and realism, and definition with the music. If two speakers were good, well then four speakers, each carrying its own program material, must be better, right? Front left, front right, rear left, rear right. Experiments with quadraphonic sound began with reel-to-reel -reel tape machines back in the middle 1950s. In 1970, RCA introduced a quad 8-track tape they called the Quad 8, but they weren't very good and disappeared from the marketplace by 1976. And just like experiments to encode stereo signals onto vinyl records in the 1950s, engineers tried to figure out how to put four channels into a single record groove. A lot of companies worked on this, including Sony, Columbia Records, and EMI. And they all agreed upon a system called SQ. But there were competing systems, QS, EV4, Quadradisc, UD4, USQ, and a few others. And all of them were incompatible with each other. And no one knew which format would win, so you had to pick a side when buying equipment, hoping that your choice would come out on top as the industry standard. Some versions required special cartridges for the turntable, special amps with the required decoders. Plus, there was the cost of two more speakers. In fact, you needed four matching speakers for best results. To be fair, when Quad worked, it worked pretty well. 
This is from a quadraphonic demonstration disc issued in 1973. Listen carefully, and you'll be able to discern some of the quad effects, even though you're just listening in stereo. Four distinct channels from an LP you can play with a standard stereo cartridge. And whatever the sounds are, whatever the source, you, the listener, are in the middle of its natural environment. Sound. All around. And around. And around. As if you were in the middle of a race course. Now, Columbia's SQ record is going to put you magically and quadraphonically off the coast of Bermuda, fathoms under the Atlantic Ocean, hearing the song of the great humpback whales. From beneath the ocean, we transport you to Broadway. Bobby, 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 B
The idea was for people to turn down their TVs and turn up their radios. Imperfect, yes, but it was better than the audio coming out of that tiny, tinny, four-inch TV speaker. And I distinctly remember this being part of the show. Proper stereo TV began with some experiments in Chicago with the public station WTTW using a system called Telesonics in 1976. These experiments worked so well that after years of work, those technical standards were adopted by just about everyone else. This was August of 1984. Here's an announcement about TV in stereo from the UK, and this is from August of 84. With the arrival of video cassette recorders and video disc players comes the possibility of stereo sound with television pictures. Indeed, several sets are now on the market with two-channel sound systems, although true stereo can only be reproduced via pre-recorded video cassettes or video discs. It's also an easy matter to hook up these stereo sources to a hi-fi system. But what of broadcast television? We're often asked when IBA transmissions and those of the BBC are going to be in stereo. The simple answer is that we don't know. At the moment, we're considering the implications of going stereo, not only on the engineering front, but also in financial and programming areas. Confining ourselves for today to engineering matters, the various methods of achieving a compatible stereo service have to be carefully studied. The Americans appear to be going for a modified version of the pilot tone system, like the one used here for stereo radio. It has to be modified to reduce the problems of the vision signal interfering with the sound. Abandoning intercarrier sound in the receiver would help a lot, but that places very severe stability limits on the local oscillator. A good compromise is a split intercarrier system, where the sound and vision IFs are separately filtered and detected, giving a 10 dB improvement in vision buzz. With this technique and also some noise reduction, the Americans can probably make the pilot tone system work quite well. The so-called FM-FM approach has been adopted by the Japanese. Once again, the left plus right signal is transmitted as normal, but left minus right is on an FM subcarrier. This gives a better noise performance than the pilot tone's AM subcarrier, and it gives better separation, allowing perhaps another language to be carried. But there is a drawback, a high distortion figure of about 2%, compared to the 0.1% possible with an AM subcarrier. So you got that? As far as I can tell, the first network TV show to be broadcast in stereo was The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, July 26th, 1984, but only in New York because that was the only affiliate that had purchased and installed the new stereo broadcasting equipment. The rest of NBC rolled out stereo broadcasting. It was all stereo by 1986, which is around the same time ABC did the same thing. CBS was in by 1987, and Fox was the last to join up in 1990. By 1994, virtually all network programming in North America was being broadcast in stereo. But still, not everybody could get it. Local stations had to upgrade their gear too, and it took until the 2000s for everyone to get into stereo TV. Of course, if you wanted to get this kind of audio, you also had to upgrade. You needed a new TV. There was something of a workaround for that, though. There was a lot of diverting the audio going to your TV so it could be sent through your stereo system. A lot of people did that so they could listen to MTV or much music in stereo. I remember fiddling with my TV in stereo so that I could listen to songs like this in 1988 in stereo while I watched the video. Eventually, though, all the old equipment aged out of the marketplace. VCRs, which were only capable of mono at first, went stereo. Then came laser discs, which looked like CDs but were 12 inches in diameter and contained digital video as well as audio. TVs became equipped with new circuitry that decoded a number of what were called surround sound systems. And today we have Dolby Surround, Dolby Atmos, DTS, and so on. These systems are all capable of more than just two-channel stereo. At minimum, you have three channels, left, right, and center. Then there's 5.1, which means left front, right front, a center channel speaker, left rear, and left right. That's five speakers. The point one refers to a subwoofer that handles all the low frequencies. So that's five plus one, six channels of audio. 
And things only got bigger from there. We now have 6.1, 7.1, 9.2, 10.2, and I've even seen 22.2. It all depends on how much money you've got to invest in your home theater setup. I was at a special playback of the Beatles' Abbey Road album at Abbey Road Studios in London. This was September of 2019. They had a special rig set up that I think was, oh God, I think it was 64 point something. Whatever it was, it was awesome. What's interesting, though, is that while more channels were being used to watch TV and movies, fewer speakers were being used to listen to music. And we'll get to that next. This is the home stretch of our two-parter on the history of stereo. If you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you probably spent a very big chunk of your disposable income on a stereo system. The ultimate goal was to have the most accurate and the most realistic sound reproduction possible in your home. That high-fidelity craze began in the 1950s and encompassed everything from records and tapes and CDs to speakers and receivers. And like I said earlier, two-channel stereo tried to expand a four-channel quad, but that didn't really work. But when home theaters started coming along in the 90s, people were ready to upgrade their audio to whatever they had with their newly upgraded video gear. With the exception of mono reissues, like what the Beatles have done with their early records, All home entertainment audio is now stereo and beyond. But then came the digital era. At first, digital meant even greater sound reproduction accuracy. That's how it was sold. But it also led to a dumbing down of audio quality. I think this began with the introduction of the MP3 in the 1990s. These music files were in stereo, but because the encoding algorithm stripped away so much information in order to make the files smaller, they just didn't sound as good as uncompressed files. People naturally started listening to these files through their computers, most of which didn't have very good speakers. But the convenience of MP3s was so great, the trade-off was worth it. From there, it wasn't much of a hop to streaming music through smart speakers. And let's be clear, if you're listening to music through a single smart speaker, you are not listening in stereo. For stereo to work, you need two separate sound sources to create that special realism. Listening to music even through the best smart speaker gives you, at best, the same experience as someone listening to a mono FM table radio back in 1965. So we have gone backwards. Convenient, yes. Audio quality, not so much. Someone with a stereo system put together in 1979 has access to better audio than someone who bought a smart speaker in 2020. Anybody else upset at this? We have another song about stereos, please. Pavement and stereo from 1997. Before we finish up, we need to have a word about headphones because this is the way so many people listening to music these days. Now, headphones are really two speakers, one for each ear. Everything we use today is descended from earpieces worn by telephone operators beginning in the late 19th century. After that, headphones were used by radio operators in the military, people aboard ships at sea, and by early radio hobbyists who needed to listen very carefully to faint signals, and the only way they could hear them were through headphones. The technology was later used for hearing aids, which, by the way, were the first transistorized devices ever, and also the first transistor radios. This was in the 1950s. These, however, were mono devices and often fitted over just one ear. It wasn't until 1958 when a jazz musician from Milwaukee named John Koss, together with an engineer named Martin Lang Jr., invented the first stereo headphones. That syncs up with the debut of the first proper stereo recordings, the first stereo reel-to-reel tapes, the first stereo LPs, and the start of the boom in high-fidelity gear for the home. These first headphones were the Koss SP3s, And frankly, they weren't supposed to be that big of a deal. They were simply an accessory for a portable turntable. But when everyone saw and heard them at an audio show, all people wanted were the headphones. Forget the turntable. Give me those things you put over your ears. 1958 was destined to become a year to be remembered. A year when the cost SP3 gave America a whole new way to listen to music. In 1957, there was no left or right channel in your headphones meaning the only way you could experience music was monophonically. 
But in 1958, John C. Koss revolutionized personal listening when he invented the world's first SP3 stereophone, bringing stereo headphones into the world and forever changing the way we all listen to music. The early audiophile headphones were very big, very clunky, and very heavy. We're talking four or five pounds. Try walking around with a set of those on your head all day. Over the decades, headphones have evolved into specific types. The first and original stereo headphones are called circumoral. That means the ears fit inside two big pads. Supraoral headphones have pads that fit against the ears. They just kind of ride on top of your ears. And then we have earbuds, which are worn inside the ear canal. There are a variety of technologies used by headphones. Moving coil, electrostatic, electret, planar magnetic, thermoacoustic, and a few others. And depending on your budget, you can get something that sounds exquisitely good. There is a debate, however, with all headphones and all earbuds. Do they offer a proper stereo experience? If you're listening to two external speakers, your brain has an opportunity to analyze the incoming audio, creating a soundstage image in your head with height, depth, distance, and so on. There is a big difference with the stereo separation you perceive hearing music through the air versus having that music pump straight and separately into each ear. I can demonstrate this. Next time you're listening to music on headphones, close your eyes and try to find the center of the stereo image. It might be very diminished or even non-existent. And note where certain instruments appear. Instead of being subtly off-center, they may appear in just one ear. And notice that some sounds seem to come from behind you. This is the product of the brain trying to locate these sounds in space, but because the audio is separated discreetly into each ear, it can't. There's been a lot of work trying to fix this through the use of binaural recording techniques, new headphone design, and tweaks that work to preserve the spatial effects of stereo sound. Experimentation continues. Now that you know the story of stereo, you might not listen to music or any audio the same way again. But hey, you know, it, it's, it's cool knowing why things are the way they are when it comes to music. Should you have any questions that deals with subjects like this, let me know through email. It's alan at alancross.ca. We can also connect via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Plus, there's my website, which is a journal of musical things.com. It's updated every day and comes with its own daily newsletter, which you should get, by the way, because it is free. Finally, hundreds of ongoing history programs are available as podcasts through every podcast platform you can think of. Please rate and review if you get a chance, because that helps with word of mouth in our rankings. Technical Productions by Rob Johnston. Talk to you next time. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music podcast with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and everywhere you find your favorite podcasts. 